Hi guys. Um, so this short lecture is to walk you guys through The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe, which is a very famous short story, as he has many, um, that fits in with sort of the gothic style that he usually does. Um, it's a very short story, but it's really a really fascinating one, and it's probably one of my favorites. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start the lecture here. Um, so the basic plot here is centered around Montresor, and he says that he has endured a thousand injuries or insults from a character named Fortunato. Um, so in the first line, Poe immediately plunges us into this revenge plot that he has cooking. Um, Montresor in this case is a fully developed round character. He's the first person narration style, so we see into his thoughts and feelings and ideas. Um, and Fortunato is his foil, so he's fairly static. He doesn't really do anything other than kind of take all of Montresor's uh, insults and do whatever he wants. So he's really there to show us the sort of madness or craziness of Montresor. Um, and we really rely on dialogue to understand the relationship between the men because we have a narrator here who is essentially an unreliable narrator. Um, <laughs> apologies for that. So the narration here is first person, so we see Montresor's point of view, but we don't know how reliable it is. Um, we see inside of his calculations and his plans and everything that he does to kind of make this, this uh, final act of revenge take place, and we see that this is not a random act of violence. It requires planning and patience um, to get Fortunato down into the catacombs. Um, we can tell that he's been planning this, plotting this, it seems, for a, a little while at least, so the question becomes, is Montresor actually mad? And by mad, we mean crazy. So the, question, the central thematic question of this story is, is he actually mad or is it, it all sort of an act? Um, and we kind of go back and forth based on what's happening in the story. So we have this central idea of Amontillado. So he takes uh, Fortunato down into the catacombs to see his uh, Amontillado, which is a type of sherry from Spain that's very expensive. Um, and Fortunato thinks that he is kind of a connoisseur. Montresor also thinks he's a connoisseur. Um, and he hatches this revenge plot that he's going to take Fortunato down and sort of wall him up in the catacombs as like this final revenge against him and, the, and you know, the injuries that have been done to him and his, to Montresor and his family. Um, so... Uh, Montresor, when he first encounters Fortunato, he brings up the Amontillado, and he counters this, his sort of challenge of, oh, I'm such an uh, 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 aficionado with his own expertise. So we already see this sort of game being played, and he repeats Amontillado several times as they kind of banter back and forth to kind of build the suspense, and it suggests that this sort of idea of desperation on the part of Montresor. And this repeated use of Amontillado really is a motif throughout the story. So it represents sort of more than just the drink. Um, it's kind of the central sticking point for these two characters to pit themselves against one another. Um, the setting is really important. So the vault here where Montresor keeps his wine is also the catacombs, where the generations of his family are buried. And he says that, you know, Fortunato has borne a thousand injuries upon him and his family. So this is fitting, and this is where he goes to take his revenge. Um, it's also uh, specific imagery that's, and settings that's chosen to add to the tone. So, for example, he says, as his fancy goes warms with the medoc, he passed through the long walls of piled skeletons with casks and punches intermingly into the most recesses of the catacombs. So he sees death and the sort of casks of um, Montiato, um kind of compiled together here in one image. That is very telling. That kind of foreshadows that this is where death is going to be taking place. Um, it's a really terrifying juxtaposition between something that's buried alive within the walls of the dead. Um, and it, then that actually goes back to the medieval tradition of writing, which romanticism and the gothic style that Poe writes in um, kind of emulate. Um, so the, the original opening scene has Carnivale happening above ground. So we have the life, we have this birth, we have this renewal, and then below we have death and decay and destruction. It's very interesting to see. So Carnivale is 
this celebration in, in a lot of European cultures um, just before Lent. Um, so right around, right before um, Lent and Easter take place. And it, it's really meant as this sort of temporary release of revelry, debauchery, celebration. Um, people go crazy and it's supposed to be the sort of getting rid of all of these crazy impulses before you have to get very serious and repent for your sins during Lent. So in uh, New, New Orleans, we call this uh, Mardi Gras, and it's along the lines of this idea of Carnivale. Um, so you'll see the idea of madness and death are really two major themes in the story. So uh, this is a, a, a repeated uh, theme that you'll see throughout Poe, Poe's works. Um, and the question is, is Montresor mad, crazy, or not? Um, so he says that he, for example, felt he put his hand on there on the catacombs after he walls up Fortunato and he feels satisfied. Um, he approaches the wall, he replies to, to Fortunato's yelling, and he kind of like continually yells back and back and forth with Fortunato because he enjoys it. Um, and he waits until the clamor on the inside gets quiet. And so the question here is, is what he's doing showing a crazy person yelling at someone that he's walling up inside of a catacomb? Or is it showing that he's actually very calculated, motivated, calm, and purposeful in his actions? Um, and there is no clear answer. So he could be sane. He could be mad. Um, he said, does the Carnivale setting, this is a, a key question, does it support this idea of madness as a temporary release of insanity, or does he simply use the Carnivale fervor as a cover for his actions? Um, death, of course, is, is a very uh, prominent theme in Poe's works, so we look at how death is described here, and we think about how these lasting effects are from Montresor. Um, does he feel remorse? Does he feel haunted? Does he feel any of those things? He doesn't say. He just says that 50 years pass and he never hears anything. Um, so again, we have this lingering idea of death, but it kind of is shut off by the end of the story. So the question goes back to, is Carnivale here kind of representing the release or is it representing a sort of cover for madness? Um, so the irony in this story is, is pretty obvious. Fortunato's name literally means fortunate in Italian where the story takes place. Um, so the verbal irony here is in what is said, Fortunato, and what happens to him are complete opposite. So he is the unfortunate one because it's his death that takes place. And this sort of matches the dark humor of a lot of Poe's works and really makes us wonder, is Montresor actually met? So I think that, oh, one more point, I'm sorry. Um, when you're reading the story, you're looking at the language, so you're looking at Poe's writing, you're looking at extended descriptions which sort of build the imagery of the setting. They create this distinct tone that we associate with both him and this sort of gothic style. Very creepy, lots of sort of, uh, you know, creepy imagery and the cave setting and the catacombs where death is just all around. Um, the language, however, is formal and respectful, so why do you think this is? How does the language contribute to the discussion of his madness? So if someone uses very proper language, it, you're less inclined to believe that that person is actually crazy. Um, so why does Poe integrate that formal and respectful language in light of the, the subject of his madness? And you also want to look at the repeated phrases. So he uses these to emphasize a particular characteristic or obsession quite often. So that idea of obsession also goes back to the idea of madness. Um, so that is Poe. So I'm going to let you guys go ahead and move on to your next assignment and let me know if you have any questions.